Okay, measuring height. Uh, be very, I'll be very quick because um, I kind of represent, um, it's not, not that we're going to be adversarial, I don't think, in this discussion. But I represent, I'll, I'll call it the status quo or where we are now. It's, um, I also like to think I represent a little bit of the history uh, of the council, which goes, goes back uh, 45 years now. Uh, but just to, to, so that everybody knows where the council stands with respect to measuring height, um, height to architectural top. It's the height measured from the level of the lowest significant open air pedestrian entrance. And, and we'll have a discussion about that, I'm sure, coming up. Um, to, uh, to the architectural top of the building. Architectural top, the top designed by the architect. Um, includes spires, but it doesn't include functional elements, such as antenna, signage, flagpoles, functional technical elements. And that was the crux of, 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 uh, of uh, the discussion we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover in historical perspective. The second, and that's the main criteria, by the way. That is the criteria by which we rank, the council ranks its buildings on the skyscraper center or the database. That's the main criteria. So you can see uh, down below here we have the top, uh, you know, 10 tallest buildings in the world, and that's, that's how they're ranked. Um, the highest occupied floor is another measure um, that we keep track of on the database. And uh, it's measured, again, from the same point down below to the top occupied floor, meaning public occupancy, not mechanical rooms, even though you can occupy a mechanical room, not elevator machine rooms, which, which uh, Johannes would like us to measure, too. Um, <laughs> but so that's highest occupied floor. And then the third measure is height to tip. And this is the one that gets people emotional because... This is what you actually see. When you look at a building, you see the bottom, or if you can stand back far enough, and you see the top. And the top, for all intents and purposes, is the height to tip from a visual standpoint. And that includes everything, flagpoles, uh, cooling towers, signage, you know, all sorts of stuff that can be at the top of the building. Now, there's a whole bunch of footnotes, which we felt that we had to add to help with some of the definitions. I'm not going to bother reading them. But it all goes back to Lynn Beadle. Lynn, Lynn Beadle was the founder of this august uh, organization, and it was a much different organization, I'll, I'll have to say, before, before Anthony turned us into a real professional, professionally driven, um, uh, focused group. Uh, Lynn was a, was a civil engineer, structural engineer at Lehigh University, my alma mater. Um, and uh, and he, uh, in 1969, he organized a group of professionals focused on, and I'll be very honest, the structural aspects of tall buildings. And he did two things. Uh, about every, every year or so, there would be a monograph that would come out uh, talking about technical aspects of buildings. And also, he kept his, what Beetle book, I think I heard it called, uh, which, which included particular data, data on tall buildings. And, of course, now it's turned into this massive, wonderfully uh, interlinked uh, um, uh, database. Now, his, his claim to fame was the famous 1996 Sears Tower versus Petronas Tower controversy, where, where and I know it's called Willis, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep on saying Sears, probably, <laughs> um, um, wh where the, the measure... Was was specifically determined. I'm not sure if, if this would, this would be if if I ever can find archival records. If there was ever really a true definition um, of height, or was it always like Lynn on the back of a back of a uh, envelope? Um, anyway, it was determined that the architectural top, which is the primary measure of Sears Tower, is basically the parapet. The architectural top of Petronas is the top of the top of these spire elements. And thus, Petronas in 1996 became the world's tallest build or buildings, I guess, because they're, they're twin towers. Um, now, wh 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 where does this all start getting, getting interesting? If, if Sears um, competed against itself, you would see, you would see the first, the first in is a very interesting, this is, a, this is a, a picture of Sears when it was under construction. And what the heck are those elements there? Well, they're structural elements that formed the basis of what was then the uh, basis of an antenna that wasn't put on until after 1982. So when Sears Tower opened, technically in about 1972-73, that, that is what the building looked like for the first, for the first uh, 10 years of exist its existence. Um, 
over the years, since 82, there have been a couple of iterations of the antenna. And here in 2006, the latest one, where actually the west antenna is now about 75 feet taller than the east antenna. But the point I'm, I'm making here is that this is an element that has changed over time. Bruce Graham, wonderful visionary architect, Foz Kahn, one of the greatest structural engineers of all time, they would not have guessed what the, well, maybe they would have guessed it, but they would not have known the exact height of the Sears Tower over time because these functional elements, this antenna, has changed over time. Um, my last couple of slides, because I know it's supposed to be three slides, and I think I'm up to nine. Um, <laughs> Burj Khalifa, starting in, in, in uh, 2003. And this is actually, this is an interesting picture, because we, were, we went to uh, Dubai in June 2003. There was Adrian. There was Kenny Turner, the, the uh, studio head uh, designer of Burj Khalifa. Um, we, were, we were sitting with, uh, with our friends at, at EMAR's uh, marketing office, and we came in uh, with a building that was 550 meters. Enough, it was tall enough to be the world's tallest building. But I think Adrian wasn't happy with the massing, and I think we would also realize that we're at the, at the start of this historic curve where we saw there was going to a lot, there was, could be a lot of competition. Uh, Taipei 101 was going to be finished about two years later. Um, so Adrian started, started filling around. So he and Kenny ended up adding, I don't know if you can see it too well, but, but all sorts of like toilet paper rolls and things to get, to get the building height. So the building height left, we left that meeting with a building of about 700 meters. And that was 2003. By, by, by the time we finished, um, we had a height of 828 meters. Uh, it was actually 818, but then we changed the rules on where to measure from. And that'll be, that'll be a discussion that we'll come up, come up with, too. But th so this is where we finished. Thanks, Anthony. I'm going to give a, a sort of an urban design approach to tall buildings. And I'm going to use the laboratory that I work in, which is the city of Toronto, where I started to work as of 2000. And this is very much the skyline, as it appears, using our 3D model, where the average building was about 30 stories. This is what is approved today. So in 14 short years, you've seen now we have the average building, which is about 50 stories. So in planning, we actually like to say that 50 is the new 30, which really makes me feel good given the birthday I just had last month. <laughs> <laughs> but we have buildings now that are in the 70s, 80s, and even 90 stories tall. We have our second super tall building. So one of the things that we like to do from a planning perspective in terms of height is make sure that the buildings are integrated. So the tops are integrated with the building. We have tall building guidelines, which you see here, that speak to the base, middle, and top. And architecturally, that's why I very much support the height criteria, although I do have one question, uh, because it actually speaks to uh, creating great pieces of architecture. And I think that's what we should aspire to. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the role of each building in the city. Not every building is a landmark. Not every building is a gateway. So we should think about the role of the tops of each building. For example, number one, the Aquasque building, where the actual curves actually create the top. Leapskin building, number four. Very fine building, number eight, by Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill, which actually capitalizes on the slope to create a lead platinum building. Uh, and then one to 50, which is, I think, we're the only city in the, in the world to actually require one to 50 scale drawings of the first five floors, because that's important too. Just a quick 30 seconds on this. At the ground Thinking about how buildings meet the street. In the past 10 years, we've added a million square feet to the public realm on site, on the site of the tall building. Think about the different personalities we have, from a rose garden to uh, a, a, a walkway that focuses on, number five, a historic building. Just like you were actually presenting this morning with the London Project. There's 60-story buildings on either side of you, but you focus on the heritage building and other examples as well. So our, our, our most recent super tall, I'm thinking about how we integrate again the top of this building. This is Frank Gehry's 92 and 82 story uh, new residential project. Original proposal on the left, three towers down to two, but taller. Original proposal on the left on the bottom could have been quite fantastic, but it took away heritage buildings and our Princess of Wales Theatre. Uh, working with the community, we've come up with this, and this was just approved. But also we have to think about the shadows when we think about the height. And in this case, we wanted to cap the height in a way that would not create shadows on our main shopping street. So integrating mechanical, thinking about the role of the building. So here's my provocative question. And it's based on the first Canadian place, which was the tallest, 10th tallest building when it was completed in 1976. 
Uh, if you are from uh, Chicago, you would know of a similar building by the same architect, Edward Durrell Stone. Uh, and uh, similar to that building, the marble has been falling off, and, and the building had to be reclad at a cost of $100 million. So a stone building is now a glass building. And one of the things that we were trying to do with Brookfield at the time was to integrate the four or five rooftop antennas that I think are actually quite unsightly. You see them in terms of the prominence on the skyline. And had we been able to do that, had we been able to clean up the top, and these are just some studies that superpose the tops of other buildings like One World Trade, would it have been an incentive, thinking that buildings change over time, to actually say that you could actually include this new top in your height criteria? So that, I think, is something that would be interesting to hear some feedback on. That. So I wanted to go back to the beginning. I mean, these guys are all talking, and I'm, I'm into steel, but I'll show you some stone. What is the essence of measuring height? What was height all about? So if we go way back, before we had all of these materials that did tensile capabilities, we had compressive materials. And so the height was pretty clear as to what was the top of that building. The, the, the tip and the architectural top were one and the same. The highest occupied floor would have been in about here, where there's, I think there's a tomb somewhere in the middle. And I don't know if a dead person is considered occupied, but so we won't talk about that. But one of the things that has happened with this building over time, because they stole all the stone off the outside of it, it's actually a little bit shorter. So that sort of pink thing at the top outlines um, what, what is presently missing and how you can actually have a tall building that gets shorter over time. And of course, then the sand drifts, and what do you do about that? So the argument here is about materiality and the completeness of the vision as being the definition of the top. And I was in, uh, at the CTBOH uh, Hong Kong tour two years ago. We had a, a wonderful opportunity to overlook uh, the IMP um, Bank of China building. And it's really kind of interesting when we go from the, the physical top of a pyramid to the top of this, where again, we've got the an antenna. We have a sort of a complete vision. But if, but if you start to look at it, and my expertise is in architecturally exposed structural steel, I can really clearly see that. I can see that this is done in a very, very careful way. But you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, in terms of the height of those spires, what the spires are, although they do seem very complete in the vision. But their, their actual end height, I would say, is a little bit more arbitrary in terms of, the, of their function. So even though those are the, the top of the building, you can start to see where the gray area comes. Um, New York City, again, you know, I would say that the, the Bank of America Tower, which of course predated uh, the New World Trade Tower, again, I'm looking at the architecture exposed structural steel detailing of this tower and see it as a very definite piece, a very definite termination to the form of the building in the way that it is, is articulated. It is not random. It is not, um, there's no guy wires supporting it. It's, it's very much a piece. And if you look at it up close, you can really see that. So when I was on, on site before they, they lifted uh, the spire for the World Trade Tower, which was prior, of course, go to my attending the meeting where it was being ruled on, what I really wanted to speak up and say was that it's architecturally exposed structural steel. This is something that is d very definitely designed. It is, it is mm -hmm. fabricated in a very particular way. And so that sort of determination would have said to me that it is part of the architecture that it is not a random piece, it is not something that's technical, it's very much uh, a part of, of the vision, it's central, it's, it's, it's very well placed. I, I came across this, uh, Wikipedia is just a wonderful resource, all of the comparisons then, you know, to go back to the idea of, of the pyramid and the pyramidal form, which I think is where, you know, some of the, sort of the, the height competition re is really getting going today because the only way that you can build super, super megatall is by going more pyramidal in your shape, which comes to the, you know, the whole issues when we're looking at the, the completion of these forms, which are both essentially pyramids, and so therefore almost the triangulation of them in that you know, perfection of the form is what determines uh, their height. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> and I, I apologize for getting your whole discipline wrong. Um, I really thought you were a structural engineer because I knew your <laughs> expertise fine. was exposed to you. <laughs> OK, I see it as my job to mix things up a bit in life generally, actually. But today, <laughs> I think it's my job to mix things up a bit. We don't want you to feel 
that this is a, um, you know, kind of CTBOH uh, fait accompli and we all agree. Actually, I can tell you behind the scenes that we don't necessarily all agree. And I think Pete and I often have um, differences on this. So, so, however, before I start, I'm playing slightly devil's advocate, okay? So don't come back to me afterwards and uh, um, give me a hard time about it. So this is what interests me. I think when this decision was made, and it predates me, predates uh, Pete, actually, in terms of this decision about counting spires and not counting antennae, the world of tall buildings was a different place. And I think the, the spirit of that decision was based on projects like this, where a spire is an extension of the form, skin, mass, and expression of the building. And if you think about the Chrysler building, I don't think anyone would argue that that, that that extension of the form, skin, mass, expression of the building. If you took away that spire, it would be a very diff different building. Uh, and to bring that to more up to date, I think Patronus has that quality, and Burj Khalifa has that quality, as opposed to the typical antennae, which again, back to the 1970s, was a modernist flat top box with some technical stuff on the top. And, and let's be honest, the technical stuff is there as a revenue generator. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, technical equipment's not put on top for altruistic reasons, it's to get, or at least telecommunication equipment is to give, get revenue in for the, for the client and uh, for the building owner. And, and so it was, a, it was a pretty clear cut, yeah? Uh, even 19, well, you know, when this was originally decided, I think it was pretty clear cut. And the, and the cases that I show you are pretty clear cut. Um, you know, I think what's changed, I think a number of things have changed. Um, what we're seeing now is we're seeing spires that hold telecommunication equipment. Um, we're seeing telecommunication equipment. There's a, there's a massive confusion between those two kind of very distinct, uh, distinct types. And, and certainly that was the case with... Oops. Um, so, it, you know, if you were going to count, if you were gonna count um, uh, antennae, then where do you stop? Would you count signage? Would you count this little anemometer which came on top of the Aeon building a couple of years ago? Did the building get 25 feet taller? Did the building get 25 feet taller? Nobody would say it got 25 feet taller, would they? When you look at that, yeah? I mean, I... <laughs> Dan O'Connor, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> well, maybe you would, but you know, it, it's a pretty clear cut case. But here's what's happened. Um, you know, mm -hmm. here are three buildings in New York. And you know what, you know what, you know, you know why? You know what distinguishes those three? Uh, you know, with all due respect to the architectural steel, here's, here's the only thing that distinguishes those three. The architect says that's a spire, and the architect says that's a spire, and the architect didn't say that was a spire, and, and I would provocatively say that it's because it was eight years before, you know, the other two buildings. So the world, this world between, you know, the Chrysler and, and, and the flat-top modernist tower with with antennae on the top has become somewhat confused. And so I think that's why the decision that was made on one world, the decision that we made on one world trade, the decision that was made between Petronas and Sears in, in the mid 90s, it confused the world. Because if you, if you look in section between uh, Sears and Petronas, um, if you asked an eight year old child which is taller, they would always say Sears. Um, and the other part of that, of course, is that the, the antennae on top of Sears has, no one would disagree with this, has become part of the cultural iconography of that building. And, it, and, and it's interesting that, that Pete showed those slides, because if you took those antennae away, <laughs> they'd be uproar in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They'd be uproar, I think, if you took those antennae off Sears now. Become co I, I never said this to you, Pete, but I kind of feel it'd be really interesting if we went back to Sears and said, you know what, why don't you think, why don't you put in a case for saying that this is now part of the cultural <laughs> iconography? Because the thing with One World Trade, and then I'll shut up, but the thing with One World Trade was, the ultimately the discussion came down to not subjectively whether the panel liked it or thought it was a spire or not, it came down to that issue of permanence. And the convincing factor was that the light 
the beacon at the top, at the height of 1776, at the top of One World Trade Center, which um, 1776 has some significance <laughs> in America. I don't quite know what it is. Uh, um, what? Um, I think, I they, think uh, he knows. It, uh, you know, it, that, that's the whole founding principle of the height of that building. So it was about, it was about that permanent, you know, that permanence. And that's what convinced the committee, or if convincing needed to happen, that it's not about whether you like it or not. It's, it's, it's always going to be there. And, and we all concluded mm. that's for sure. The current criteria have unintentionally encouraged developers to build higher and higher spikes atop their buildings in an area that demands greater efficiency and lower carbon footprints for its buildings. This should be cause for some alarm and refinement to the criteria to discourage the construction of resource intensive, intentionally function free spires. So I'm going to put it in some provocative language, playing devil's advocate, which Pete doesn't like me doing, but here's what we're saying. You know, I stood up this morning and said, every expenditure of carbon needs to be justified on multiple levels. So if you put something on the top of your building which has a function, which is, you know, telecommunication equipment, it doesn't count. But you put some architectural fluff on top of the building, and it counts in the height. What I would ask, what are we measuring? Are we measuring man's ability to put man above the plane of the Earth? Man's ability to put materials above the, the plane of the Earth? Or is it really about a distinction between an architectural expression and, and a material expression? Um, so on that note, are we measuring man's ability to put materials above the plane of the Earth, man above the plane of the Earth, or um, some architectural expression above the plane of the Earth? But we're actually measuring all three. It's the primacy of the measure. And I think from my perspective, the important one is the architectural expression integrating the top of the building with the base and the middle. Mm -hmm. I would say that we are measuring how high we can put material above the ground. I don't know if that's what we should be doing in, in architecture and in design and in making cities and densifying the planet. Because again, that goes to the, the bigger question that if we're trying to live more compactly in order to use less resources, then to try to you know push material up for the sake of a, a big, I'll, I will leave a blank, a big blank contest between people, then I think that that's, um, that's something that we have to really look at. Because yes, it does, it, this does in, encourage it. How would, you, how would you rate a building which is 10 stories with an 800 meter spire on top? Well, it's not a building. It wouldn't be well, a building. It's a building. It's no, 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 I'm, I'm, no, I'm serious. The, uh, if, again, the, uh, the, the, the uh, skyscraper center um, web page has um, criteria. And one of the first criteria is, is it a building or is it a uh, tower or a telecommunications tower? And so it has to be more than 50% occupied and that, you know, to, be a, to count as a building. But, uh, but I'm not going to use the word, but there, <laughs> there are buildings that have significant spire compared to occupied space. So 50% of the height of the building needs to be occupiable floor, which is what distinguishes a building from a telecommunications tower. Right, so it could be a 400 metre building with a 400 metre spire. Could be. high tower, but only 30% uh, would be uh, with real floors, uh, it will be taller than the existing one. So the first criteria that you are mentioning with 50% has to be discussed. Well, I, Actually, I, I, I agree. I mean, I come from a context where we've had the tallest freestanding structure for 30 years, our CN Tower from 1970 to the 2000s. But it's not a building, and I certainly agree with the building because it doesn't meet the height criteria or the 50% criteria. And there's a very different thing about constructing a telecommunications tower that has seven occupied floors and a building that has a number of occupied floors. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, actually, the point that you raised, George, is, is, is interesting because what we're seeing is the, the extreme heights that we're going to now is challenging a number of the criteria. Today we're talking about the principles behind the criteria, but, but um, so I, I'll give you another example. Part of our criteria say that for a building to be mixed use, it needs to constitute 15% of the total floor area, yeah? So... The Burj Khalifa might have a 30-story hotel in there, 
which are, are 20 stories, which is a significant sized hotel, but it might not quite be 15% of the floor area, so it ain't mixed use. Can you see, see what I'm saying? It, so the extreme heights that we're seeing today is going to challenge some of that criteria, but maybe we'll come back to those points. I want to stick with this issue of, of spires and antennae to begin with and what we are actually measuring. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jim Fortune. I think you guys are missing the uh, original design. It was a Chrysler building against the Empire State Building. No, actually 40 wall. 40 wall. Yeah. 40 wall. That's that was the original design. The Empire State Building, as I understand, it, had three spires actually constructed waiting to see how tall the Chrysler building was going to be before they put on a spire that was higher. And also, the original spires were not antennas or for design. It was for an airship landing, believe it or not. So what are you going to what are you going to call an airship landing when and if we get airships back? Just a, a, a <laughs> just a, no, but, a quick. But quick. you know, having said that, Jim, that 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 uh, that tower on top is actually occupied because you look where they measured the highest occupied floor in, on the uh, Empire State Building. It's 102nd level, yeah. which was the disembarkation point, theoretically, of the one time that they tried to. Just yeah, to clarify, the, uh, the Empire State Building came about six cool. months later. Yeah. The original competition that made headlines in the time was between the Chrysler Building and 40 Wall, which is a building in Lower Manhattan. It's now a Trump Hotel. Uh, and, and Chrysler yeah. constructed the, the, the spire inside and then lifted it in yeah. place. So 40 Wall, which was a Craig Severance building. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, Craig Severance was the Chrysler Building. But then the, the Empire State, Van Allen. Six, the, 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 that yeah, came in on the Van Allen was But it was all much easier then, wasn't it? Well, it was all much easier. You know, it wasn't kind of, although the mooring mass for the blimp is arguably, that was technical. That's technical equipment as well, yeah? I don't care if it's a spire or an antenna. The, the criteria should be that it's functional, not decorative. So I, I think that's a better that's criteria. I, I really don't care if it's a spire or an antenna yeah. for the height. I really don't. But, but you're saying the opposite. Spires, but you, you, what you're saying is you'd like the primacy decorative. to be the tip. Yeah. Because we already have that criteria. You, you it's just, that. yeah. If it's functional, a spire, uh, an antennae, and it's functional, it doesn't count in the height. So you voted in, in our criteria. Right, right. Yeah? In an age of sustainability, that doesn't kind of equate, no? Well, that's not a thing to do, though. I mean, the, the an antenna on the top of a building so that it's not wasn't designed by the architects as part of the, the building. The, the client didn't, in his dreams, imagine, I can't wait to get the highest antenna in the world. He wanted the highest building in the world, right? So that's what you give him. Okay. Maybe I'm very simple. But, to, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge for me, being a sustainability director of a company designing the tallest building in, <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Which, <laughs> Talk so, about a conflict. Uh, and, and one of my answers is, well, if somebody else did it, they'd do it less sustainably. <laughs> You know, it's a pretty simple <laughs> way to, to look at it. Because it's the client that actually wants the tallest building, and the architect's e ego is going to compete to, to be the one that gives it him. But we're not paying for the building. We're not, um, we're, we're not the ones actually doing it. Responsible, if you know what I'm saying. It's Financially. For, yeah. for requesting it. I, I mean, actually, that's quite an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, maybe we should just step back from this. It, it, is the race for the tallest... Is the quest for the tallest building in the world a valid quest? Should, should mankind be doing that anyway? Well, what, what should? What, what, is, what does should have to do with it? Yeah, what, I, <laughs> you know, Siena. I mean, they kept on building taller towers. Why? I mean, it takes two things to build the world's tallest building. A pile I'll tell of money you and a big ego. Because they didn't have nine billion people predicted to urbanize in a screwed up planet. That's why, yeah? Is that not why? So in, a, in the age and the challenge that we have in front of us today, should we, should we be building kilometer high towers? Is that off subject? No, I go back to Chris Drew's density study. You're, you actually opened the question, should we be building tall buildings at all? <sighs> Bill Maybush. For, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a simple uh, discussion of spire versus antenna. And, 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 and really, because the way we look at it, some of us, is that a spire is meant to be part of the permanent architectural completion of the building. And antennae, as we know, and you, you showed us some examples, uh, they can change, they can be removed, they can be added to, they can be modified. And antennae, for me, are not permanent. Uh, I don't consider them permanent. It's, it's technical and it can change, whereas the architectural elements are more, have much more permanence. And that's, and that's what the High Committee basically agreed. 
So um, and, uh, this, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of having fun here, but th this was not, when we had the discussion on World Trade Center, it was not a light-hearted discussion, really. I mean, it was serious discussion because people are putting serious money. Seri I mean, you know, seven-figure, you know, actually, how many figures? Nine, ten figures um, uh, to build these buildings. And, and they expect, the, the important thing is, is, is that everybody has the same rules. And, 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 and kind of that's why we have to be, uh, again, I'll put the sober hat on for a second. That's why we have to be very serious about, about this discussion. And, and, and I guess I'd add to that because buildings are, are planned over a decade yeah. before okay. they get built. So those rules, I do think, also have to be consistent because the architect of the 1.2 kilometer building, who we don't know of right now, is actually using the rules right now sure. to actually plan and design their buildings. I mean, I go back to, to the, the, form, the form of the building, and I think that for the World Trade Tower, what brought the entire issue to question was that it wasn't pyramidal, and that it had the appearance of being a square tower with something on top of it. And so therefore, the, the disjunction in the form between the top of the, the, the building and the element on top was what created the controversy. That had it been something that was more clearly part of the form and it had that sort of triangular completion as with, with the Kingdom Tower or Burj Khalifa, that you're less questioning that as far as an architectural idea mm -hmm. than this disjunction and saying, well, then it, it didn't really physically have to be this height or this height or this height. They wanted it to be 1776 because that was important. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that's where the the sort of the break in the discussion right. starts is this what is how important is that to the form it's important to the number in this case because it was historic mm -hmm. but it really wasn't important to the form the form would have mm -hmm. been the same if it was you know 10 feet taller or shorter <laughs> nobody on the ground would have been able to tell the difference mm -hmm. yeah i think we also um when we had this discussion we have to be careful about getting too involved in, in aesthetics because Remember when the rules first started, it was all Mies boxes, you know, with flat roofs, and we had we had a we had a roof criteria, which we don't have anymore. Aesthetics right. will the the aesthetics of buildings will constantly change as designers get new ideas, and they could start by you know dumping a load of steel on the top of the building and calling. I mean, uh, I'm I'm being facetious, but but um, it's sometimes I I don't think we can predict, nor do I think we should like legislate what. Uh, uh, the next generation of designers, um, you know, does. Well, I, I would fully agree with, you know, you're not wanting to, to tell people what to design. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, yeah. I'm just recognizing that the, the form of the building had a bit more of the Miesian oh, sure. mm -hmm. basis to mm -hmm. it, which would make you question. Mm -hmm. I, say, I think yeah. part of it is, is there a question about mm -hmm. the height? And well, the question comes when it doesn't clearly seem to be necessary for the form or integrated. I mean, the, the issue with the subjectivity, you see, what concerns me with our criteria is it is really down to the architect, a single person, s without subjectivity. Without us being a subjective panel, then really it is down to us taking the word of a single person saying, yes, that is a spire, not an antennae even if it functions as an antennae. I mean, the One World Trade Center, for example, is, is fully planned to have an technical equipment on top of it. And, and that, that concerns me. I don't think our, cri you know, I think there's a, a hole in, in, in our criterion. And part of the reason that One World Trade became an issue was because when they took, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. <laughs> when they took the cladding yeah. off, yeah. David Childs went on record, yeah, and said, it, almost literally, verbatim, it is a shame they have taken the cladding off the spire and turned it into an antennae. More or less, he said that. And, and so our criteria was, well, if the architect says it's a spire, it's a spire. And there's no. the bloody architect saying it's now an antennae. The press picked up on that and exposed a huge hole. Yeah. So, so we, we kind of don't want to be subjective, but as an alternative to subjective, it's down to one guy, you know, saying, well, that's a spire, even if it functions as an antennae. I think there are problems in that. But, but, don't, you, but don't you right. think, I mean, in terms of sustainability and adaptability that we've been talking about in a lot of these sessions, that it would be better to promote the use of a spire also 
as an antenna in order to give it more purpose mm -hmm. up there and actually try to convince people to combine the two as a way to really validate this, this element on, on top of the roof as having a function as well as being mm -hmm. architectural. So that would be a good thing to push people yeah. to. Which one predominates? Yeah. Even permanent with, with a spire is not, not, it's not permanent. It, it can change. If we have a modernization, it can change. Uh, I, I feel for Terry, um, in principle, when she talked about the, the, uh, the, the shape of the building, uh, if, if you could somehow def define it in, in, in any mathematical way, a continuation of your building, that is a, a very distinct way of, of fixing uh, your, your architecture and somehow that this is part of the architecture and this is something which you can then do whatever with. Yeah, if you fix it somehow uh, with a mathematical formula, hmm. uh, like the, well, the, then the what extension would happen? of the building. What do you think would happen then? A lot of buildings get lower at the moment, I know. They'll put a lot more of material because they're still going to want to go up higher. Of I mean, you could, what you could, again, this is we're in the land yeah, of, but, of but unintended for example, look consequences. At, look, look at, uh, for example, the Bush al Arab. Yeah, that's, an, that's a mathematical shape up there. It's a pretty empty building, yes? Uh, especially that upper part there. But, but it's absolutely part of the building with a mathematical formula all the way to the top. Yeah, but well, that's still a stylistic argument because yeah. the Burj Khalifa has 270 meters of empty space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, still, that's a big but it's, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's still, an, but it's, it's it's still part an of the building. That's why it doesn't matter if it's a spire or an antenna. And, and if you get rid of that criteria, you eliminate the hypocrisy of the whole um, county. Hey. Yeah, I, I mean, well, why I, does it matter? Stop talking about it as an antenna or a spire. It's part of the building. Oh, you know, now, Marshall, all we're doing, we're keeping a list. That's all we're yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. We just keep the number. We're defining the list. See, here's where it starts getting emotional. It's just, no, it's just a set of numbers. It's only if you it's care about it that, that no, people I, start no, getting I, red I, in I, the face. Exactly. It's hypocritical that if it's a spire, <laughs> if it's an antenna, it's the height it's of the numbers. building. Well, well, However you want to do it. I would rather see more sustainable spires than unsustainable spires. Okay, spire. devil's advocate, Marshall. Devil's advocate, again. Let's look at this slightly different. Um, perhaps, are we, you know, the original decision, was it not trying to advocate for better architecture? I mean, in, in a way, it's a more considered response to the top of the building. Is it trying to encourage a more... You know, th this is a very valid point. In fact, I, I heard James say that this is what James's point is, so I'll refer to him. But, but actually, it's trying to encourage architects to consider the termination of the building rather than just, you know, plonk it as a flat roof. Doesn't the criteria encourage and, that? And, and I guess in addition, in addition, buildings do change over time. Yeah. So what happens if a building is actually yeah. recliding yeah. itself? I think it's more worth discussing. Mm -hmm. Can a building get taller over time? Well, I, I, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think there's any debate on that. I mean, the tour first. Mm -hmm. Well, look at the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield in Chicago. Added mm -hmm. 50 stories to it or something. And tour first in Paris is kind of... So there's no question about that. We would definitely remeasure the height of the building, although the architect's intent might have massively changed. The, the original architect wasn't included in it. But uh, Richard, you had a point. Uh, the point that you made, what is it that we're measuring, I think should be the primary mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. idea. And for me, it should be we should be measuring our ability to put man above the surface. Because anything mm -hmm. other than that is far too subjective. Mm -hmm. And what, what I think of in particular, which uh, George's point I thought was a very good one, is if we took the CN Tower and put that on top of the Shanghai Tower, that would be the tallest building, because it would be taller than the, um, than the Kingdom Tower. But the CN Tower alone doesn't count. Mm -hmm. So if it was just that by itself, it doesn't count. So why would it count somehow when it's on top of something? And so if we're saying a freestanding structure doesn't count, then why does a freestanding structure on top of a building count? Well, because it's not freestanding. It's part of the structure. I mean, there's one thing we have to But it's not, because you're, you're measuring material. So if I can't measure material when it's by itself, why can I measure material when it's on top of something? There is yet another perspective that we're not talking about, and that's the perspective of the lay people, the ordinary people. You know, when I drive up to Chicago, if the New York building were, into, were in Chicago next to Sears, I would just see the silhouette, and I, I would have an impression of which building is taller. And that's a majority, a large majority of people. I mean, like Peter just mentioned, we care about these things because, you know, it's recorded somewhere, or somebody wants to brag that I have the tallest building or, or whatever. But to the lay people, it's just the silhouette of the building. And 
that's I, their perception. I, I just want to clarify, because I think uh, One World Trade with its spire is still taller than Willis with its two antennas. Yeah. Is that oh, it is. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here's, so but here's but my but point. I, I see your point. My point. Yeah. 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 You, may, you may know this, Abbas, because historically, then, the Sears Tower from 1972 to, to 2001 would have been the world's second tallest building. Because World Trade Center mm -hmm. in New York right. had, had, a, a had a taller antenna. antenna. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, actually, it's an interesting aside. I don't know whether anyone in Chicago either doesn't know that or chooses to forget it. Because that, that was such an emotive debate. But the yeah. day that that decision was made between Sears and Patronus, mm -hmm. Sears was going to lose either way. Sears was either, Patronus was going to beat it, yeah. or the history books would have had to be rewritten because it would never have been the tallest. Because yeah. as Pete says, yeah. One World Trade, the original One World Trade in New it's York, taller. the antennae was taller than it was on Sears. But you know, in this emotive debate, no one ever kind of raises that in Chicago. What does the council understand is the audience for this criteria, other than an internal one? The main aspect and possibly the only aspect of the council which has a massive uh, public interest in it you know so when i said that was our single biggest press moment the other single biggest press moment was the 1996 thing and then the the other one was the vanity height study that we should last year which we might get back to later so so ordinarily i would say the stuff that we're talking about this week and that kind of stuff very rarely gets into the public realm but this is i mean that decision on one world trade was we, we, we did this simultaneous broadcast in London, announcement in London and Chicago. It was being streamed New live York, York. on most of, the, most of the American television channels anyway, yeah. albeit the online version, but, you know, CNN and all the rest of it. And it was on the front page of several newspapers in the U.S., and it was in most newspapers around the world. So it, it was a very big... And the reason is because this does capture the public imagination and... Um, you know, I, I kind of agree with, 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 with what Abbas was saying, and in a way what Marshall was saying is, as people look at these buildings, they don't look at it and think, well, what is that little thing on the top and does it count? And where is the person actually in it? They're, they're measuring the impact of this, instinctively judging, looking at the impact <coughs> of this thing above the plane of the earth. Have, you, you, have you had as much trouble with where the bottom is? When the original, the original 1996 or up till 2009, actually, um, the original measuring point at the bottom was the sidewalk in front of the main entrance. Mm -hmm. And that was all it said. And that's great for an urban building like Sears, although I'm not quite sure which sidewalk it was, because uh, it's <laughs> not at the same level. It's, but it's great for a building built in a built urban environment. The new tall buildings are not, not being built there. They're built, being built in the middle of a desert without an urban context. So we actually, uh, it, started, it started in 2007, where we had a, a height committee. Can I finish, George? We had a height committee uh, meeting to talk specifically about the top and the bottom. But we ended up talking more about the bottom because where Burj Khalifa is built, the actual ground plane was at plus 3.5 meters above sea level. The, 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 and that happens to be about a meter above our B3 level. <laughs> In other words, we built above it. Oh, yeah, here you go. And then the building itself, the, the, if, you know, Burj Khalifa has three wings, and each wing has a distinctive, um, um, uh, and has three main uh, prim primary uses, office, hotel, and residences. And each wing, uh, or in between each wing, is, a, is an entry, this, this uh, glass pavilion. And the pavilion um, is the drop-off. And each one of these drop-offs is at a different level. So there's actually, there's actually um, a significant uh, difference in height uh, between the, the highest is, is the residential, the middle is the, is the and the uh, office is at the bottom. And there's actually, what even makes it more complicated is there, there's an oculus down to the actual, actual drop-off. So, so we were trying to figure out, where do you measure this? Because it's not an urban context. And it's all, it's all built above grade, basically. So, so the, and I, I, again, I'm kind of teasing here, but I mean, there was, this was a committee decision. We actually took a vote. Um, and, and that's where we got a lot of our footnotes, because we, we agreed that the bottom point of measurement could be the lowest significant meeting pedestrian public 
entrance into the building, open air entrance into the building. And, and it not only affected um, Burj, um, um, because it was, it, but this wasn't built yet. It was, I mean, it was under construction, it wasn't occupied yet. But it affected a couple of other buildings. It affected Trump specifically, because Trump Tower had, is. Before, slide before. Oh, uh, okay, Trump Tower, um, the initial, initially was measured at, a, um, at upper, upper Wabash. Uh, and Upper Wabash is actually a bridge over the actual ground plane. And the ground plane, uh, this added, uh, I want to say 30 feet? 27. 27? Okay, mm -hmm. close enough. Um, uh, so, so it was agreed that you could measure a building like this, because there are entrances at both levels, from the lowest open air entrance. And so that, un unfortunately, this is the, dump, the no, there's, the, what's, what's, we live, uh, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. So, so Trump then m displaced Jin Mao <laughs> by, by seven feet, uh, by change, changing that. So we did, we did kind of change history. Yeah, world, world trade, yes. But again, now, now this goes back historically. These buildings take, in the case of, of Burj Khalifa, what I say, 2003 to 2010, seven years to build. Um, the, in the case of world trade, uh, sorry, in the case of world trade, um, it, you know, it, it's taken 13, it's not even occupied yet, 14, 15 years to build. So, so they actually started under the old rules, which was the, the primary entrance at, at uh, the, the, you know, the sidewalk level. And so, so um, you know, th that's why I think we have to be careful about changing these rules. And I, I you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm certainly not uh, suggesting that we change these rules at this point, because these investments are big investments and they take a long time to, to come to fruition. And so I think it's very important that we have stability uh, in the rules. But ju I mean, just to reiterate, because I think it is a, a very interesting point, so you're all aware, that, 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 it was the condition at the base mm. that drove the change in the criteria. Yeah. Actually, the condition at the top hasn't changed in the criteria at all. Yeah. But this terminology, you know, like, like, like Pete said, it just said, height is measured from the sidewalk outside the main entrance. Change two, height is measured from the level of the lowest significant open air pedestrian entrance in all the criteria where each one of those became footnoted. And you know, we won't go through it all in detail, but what is level? Finished floor level at the fresh threshold of the lowest entrance door. What is significant? The entrance should be predominantly above existing operator. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. And, and, and as Johannes says, you were at that meeting as well, Johannes, yeah? Um, the issue with one world trade, again, stays within this room, but, but it was all focused on the top. But the issue at One World Trade was the, there was a, the main entrance off the plaza, mm -hmm. but then a, an entrance, I think, seven feet lower. Marsh, was it seven feet, yeah? A little, less, little less than six feet. Little, little less than six feet. So that building, even if the spire was going to count, it was like, well, it's going to be 1,776 plus just short of six. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how the hell? You know what? Oh, and, and of course, this was such an emotive height yeah. because of the 1776. And, and I, I couldn't see how that was going to change at all because um, it was open air, it was pedestrian, it, you know, it was everything. And in the end, in the end, the reason that it didn't come into play was because of this word significant. And, and we, we, that, that was not connected with One World Trade. We'd wordsmithed this. I mean, we re really took a lot of time to come up with that four years before on the back of on the back of uh, Virgin and Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and what Skidmore had done, you know, which was, and, and by the way, Skidmore were very rightly pissed off about this whole thing because they designed the building to the criteria. Yeah. 10 years before, you know, yeah. that building or whatever, eight years before. But, um, but what they showed very, very cleverly, they showed a, uh, they showed a flow analysis of people entering the building from the, and that lower entrance, they predicted that it was less than 5% of the building would, people would enter that building that way. And therefore they said, so in our consideration, that is not significant, which I thought was very good. Um, so, so, so everyone went home and slept easy That's on true. it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, so it, it, is, it is pretty complex. I, I wanted to also add that I disagree with the way that you're defining the bottom. Yeah. I, th I think you make it very complicated, and I don't think it needs to be that complicated. You should be measuring how far you can put man above the condition yeah. which you find. So 
if you just say the average grade of the site which you find, that's the condition you found. You can do all kinds of monkey business to play with it, but if you have no, nothing but the condition which you find, there's no way you can cheat. The same with, you can't cheat by putting you know, a single 300 story uh, floor on top of the building. But yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that, Rich. I, I, mean, I, I know you don't, because you're the height committee. I'm saying I disagree with the criteria you've set out Good. Because with the, the 300 yeah. footnotes afterwards. The point, the po well, yeah, I mean, the footnotes I can see are a problem. But, but mm -hmm. you know, equally, in the same breath, we're kind of saying we're measuring the... We're, what are we measuring? The average person who doesn't care about all this just wants to say, there's the top, there's the bottom, and that's what we're measuring. But that bottom often has no relationship at all, the visual bottom, to the pre-existing grade. In most cases, yeah. I would say, it has no bullets. relationship whatsoever. So, so that's why that complex criteria came about. You know, Trump, Trump, if you stand on the south side of the Chicago River, it's, 30, it's 27 feet taller. No one would argue against that, yeah? In my mind, what we're measuring is accomplishment and architectural accomplishment, not sculptural accomplishment, not engineering accomplishment. I think Adrian would disagree with that. It's not architecture all the way up to the top. <laughs> I mean, well, well, most architects. I'm, architects, raise your hand. I'm just saying it's like all it, it's well, Accomplishment what, can also go yeah. down. So yeah. you think, how exactly. deep do the foundations yeah. need to go? Can do so all maybe you need to I go down to come bedrock. To <laughs> we actually had a very senior structural engineer, John Zills, who was a uh, wonderful uh, mentor and was, was on the original Sears team structural team. And he said, why don't we measure from the bottom of the caisson to the top of the antenna? Or why don't we measure to the, to the top occupied floor? I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at this. But there's a structural height. There's a structural un... Uh, there's a, there's a, a point where the building is laterally braced and where it's not laterally braced, which might be in the basement somewhere. But we don't. If we did that, we, yeah. we potentially have um, not only inflated height, but inflated depth. You could imagine. Right. Yeah. Well, let's make the piles, uh, the caissons, 400 feet deeper <laughs> than they need to be. Cheaper, <laughs> cheaper, cheaper to put it down there. <laughs> Again, to play devil's advocate. Uh, from a layperson's point of view, uh, w how do you decide between these? I mean, you had three different conditions uh, on the screen. Uh, the, the public doesn't understand these things. How do we pick one? Uh, when you say the tallest building, how do we, do we know how, pe what, People, uh, I mean, in, uh, oftentimes people think highest occupied floor. When I say the tallest building, that's probably what most people think. So how do you decide between these three and when we announce? They have to ask Lynn Beadle. I mean, because ultimately it goes back to that. We're, 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 you know, good, better, and different. We're stuck with history. I think it goes back to Chrysler, right? No one would doubt the fact that the top of the Chrysler building is William Van Allen secretly put that spire inside the hubcaps and then raised it in place. It was a fantastic moment in skyscraper design. And nobody would doubt, I think, in this room that that is the top of that building, even though yeah. it's rich, not rich the highest, room. well, <laughs> even though it's not the highest occupied floor. Yeah. Unstylistically, the Sears Tower antennas don't fit with the building. I think they do. I, I, I actually That's agree a, with so you. It, it, I, to I, me, it's I, a hypocritical I, argument. As you no, I, I actually uh, agree with you. I think that the personality of the Hancock building, for example, includes those rabbit ears. That's very much part of <laughs> that aesthetic of that. Could, could we you, An Anthony, you mentioned several times, is it an antenna, is it a spire? And if I understand you, in the end, it's the architect who decided. And then Peter mentioned the way to measure the base. I would say you, you would ask anyone in the street, when you measure the height of anything, you measure it from the base. So the question is, where is the base? I have just a question. You say, and it could be a problem, but you say that in the end, today, it is the architect who tells you where is the top. So why don't we ask the architect where is the base? Instead of the CTBUH having a, a no, criteria. We, we, I don't say that. George, we do. <laughs> we do. When, when, when a building gets added to the then database. Then for Trump, did the architect tell, told you, tell yes. you where is the base? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they measure Absolutely. on their drawing. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's yeah. not... So, so, so we get... Uh, we, and now maybe in the day that you were involved, there, there wasn't a formal submission process. There's a formal submission process now where we, we get drawings, well, ultimately from the owner. Um, we get drawings from the owner that, that clearly articulate the, the points, the three major points. Sorry, again. You get the drawings from, from 
the uh, architect or the owner. But I is it the architect or the owner who tells you where is the base, or you manage well, to I find out where is the base? No, they, 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 ah, okay. they I'm identify sorry. it. Now, of course, maybe we can question it. It's obvious to me that there's a number of different statistics uh, and heights and, and uh, uh, KPIs that you can measure for, for tall buildings. Um, and personally, I have a problem with spires from a sustainability perspective. So I'm just wondering whether uh, all that data is available, and that's fine, but should the CTBUH uh, be promoting and emphasising uh, the heights of buildings which are the most sustainable from here on in? Because... We're talking about the future now. We're talking about sustainability, low carbon, low embodied energy, and we should be, as an organisation, I believe, starting to try and drive buildings to be more sustainable. Well, that's a very good segue <laughs> into this next issue, which I, I think we can put up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, which, because Lester, we, we we produced a report about 18 months ago which I can tell you now upset more people within our membership than at any other time. <laughs> and, and, the, and to third, point, uh, the third most uh, Yeah, the third, third big, I mean, it, it was, in a way it was kind of no press is bad press. It, it went all around the world in all the newspapers. But I do think actually, as an aside, that, that, that we handled it wrongly because <laughs> the issue which we're, I'm going to tell you now, um, it, but basically we issued, we issued this report, let me just explain. We issued this report and we called it vanity height. And it was a measure of the architectural top of the building as a ratio of the highest occupied floor. And, and this gets back to the sustainability issue. And I think this was a very valid point, a very valid study, and we should have done this report. So I would argue that with any, anyone. I think the mistake was calling it vanity height because that loaded it, you know, that, 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 that already edged it against from, from, from the neutrality and let people decide themselves. <clears throat> but this was the building that, 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 as has been used, was the vainest, uh, the Burj Al Arab, which came out at 39% non-occupiable height. Um, uh, but that was, the, um, that was the, t the tallest 10, I think. Um, so the, the Burj Al Arab was the tallest in terms of percentage but the Burj Khalifa was the tallest in terms of pure height. Uh, as we see there, 244 meters. To, and, and you know, uh, we d uh, the, uh, one of the asides, one of the side things out of this study was, if the spire on Burj Khalifa was on its own, it'd be something like the 17th tallest building in the world. <laughs> or something, wasn't it like that? Yeah, some, some snippet. We're number one. <laughs> tallest yeah. building in Europe. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so in, a, in, in, in a way, Lester, I think this, this gets at your point that, that, that the council is trying to raise some of these issues. Because, you know, one thing I, I think most people in the council would agree, certainly on the leadership structure is, and actually this, re this, 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 this annoys the hell out of me, when we're seen as being the promoters of extreme height. Uh, I don't think that we are. I don't, certainly within the leadership structure, I don't. We, that we measure height and we track all tall buildings. And then we, we issue these lists, the 100 tallest buildings, the 100 tallest this. And because of that, it seems that we are promoting height. And, and, and of course, height's going up. And so it looks like we're promoting extreme height. But I don't think that we are. I know I'm not personally. Uh, if anything, I'm, I'm perhaps the other way. Um, but this was a, this was a very interest, interesting study. But I'll tell you something that's just, so uh, this, this, this died a death. So, so it got big publicity, and then it died a death. And about a month ago, some newspaper picked up on it again. And I knew because the next day I came in and I had 100 complaints again. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, so the, the teams behind some of these projects are getting back and said, you know, why has all this come up again? And, and I'll tell you just an interesting point. If you're measuring, if you're measuring highest occupied floor, right, and we define highest occupied floor. It's something like uh, people work or live there in a com permanent capacity. It's conditioned space. It has access to fire, fire exits. In other words, it isn't mechanical plant, mm -hmm. right? So if you take Burj Khalifa, and let's say that's the highest occupied floor, if it has four floors of mechanical plant, then it doesn't, that, that plant, that MEP plant doesn't count in the, high, in the highest occupied floor. Yeah, but if that if that MEP plant was there, 
and it pushed the highest occupied floor up, then it would count. And, um, and that's why some of the teams are getting, get, you know, kind of getting a bit upset about this, this whole vanity hype, because it's not really very fair. And I think that's actually a valid point, yeah? The thing with the, with the but, MEP plan. I don't know. I, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of towers have mechanical floors part way up. I mean, they, they distribute them. Mm -hmm. So, so, what I'm so they're, they're yeah. all like that they're anyway. So yeah. it's not just that chose to put it on top or below. Well, I, would argue, it's, I would argue that a mechanical floor um, uh, is not a vanity floor because it's needed for maintaining everything else. Anything above that <laughs> would be vanity. But the, 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 the point I'm making is this. Let me try and articulate it. If your quest is to gain a title, and let's say we changed it from architectural height to our highest occupied floor, then you are going to get owners and developers who will strategically <coughs> not put MEP at the top of the building, yeah? Mm -hmm. Even though that might make the best sense from a functional, e economic, and sustainability viewpoint, but be putting it at strategic places within the building to pump up the highest occupied floor height. So. You know, we, so what if it's highest that's functioning that's floor? So again, instead of this you know, spire, we, we can't put, uh, you don't want to put antennas and spires together because that would make spires somehow functional. Why, can, why is the occupied floor not human occupancy, but why can't it be a functional floor? So it is a functioning floor. It has a programmatic use. And that would take into account both things and would be more fair. So it is, as long as it has a functional space requirement that's quite necessary. It could be. I think the reason it's not is, again, goes back historically. When you go back to look at the buildings that were identified highest occupied floors, again, Lynn Beadle, mm -hmm. poor guy, is probably turning in his grave. Um, it, he measured to the, to the kind of the highest, pub, in Sears, it's the, it's the observatory, the highest public floor, even though there's mechanical and... person could go the Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah and well, uh, I got a question for you. How, how do you calculate the area of refuge? Newer buildings have it, and some of the older buildings mm -hmm. didn't ever have area refuge. When you say calculate it, it well, I mean, it's part it's part of the occupied yeah, space. If it's below, yeah, it's no, it's no, it's they're not occupied. <laughs> they're not, but they're they're. It's like a st is a stair, you know, it's a stair. It's a really extensive stair. It's a usable space, functional well, space. Is, in a new building, if you have to have it, you probably add that to the height of the building. Or an older building. Well, of course, of course, it 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 will push things up the building. Just, at, just a point, and it's an observation, really. Yeah. We, we've all talked about the size of the building mm -hmm. and the fact that it's a beautiful mm -hmm. composition. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, looking at this slide, if we take the word vanity out of it, it's about the completion of the top. And if you just mm -hmm. simply chop the top of all of those buildings off, yeah. if, you, if you don't mind, if you're just going to that slide, if you simply chop the top of those buildings off, would that be acceptable? Would that, would that actually terminate those tall buildings? And we talk about sustainability, and you're absolutely right. It seems inappropriate to be a bit gratuitous uh, or arguably gratuitous with materials. But, but the, other, the other side of it is that if we didn't have those tops, you couldn't have the bottoms because they would just look ugly and inappropriate or, or wouldn't right. terminate and work on the skyline. It's just a, it's just a discussion. And, and that, that an certainly goes back to the point that I presented in terms of and, and thinking how we view things from a planning perspective is that we do want to make sure that the tops are integrated. You just don't want to make sure that you have a mechanical plant and a chiller and some dishes on top of a building. You want to make sure that the architecture is able to actually complete his composition. And, and I think, you know, we have to look at the word sustainability because it is just so overused these days. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we go to the, to the interpretation of cultural sustainability and then go back to what you were saying, Anthony, about trying to look at it, if towers differently from the places in which they exist and reflecting the culture and, and the history of the architecture, different places around the globe, then we have a history of architecture mm -hmm. and form that has spires, has tops, has things that, that complete them, that begin to make these, these artifacts we're creating now have more to do with the culture of the place. So there's sort of a, a level of cultural sustainability that maybe validates some of these forms as being you know, necessary. I mean, you, know, you, you look at some of the pagodas and, and other kinds of, of, of yeah, churches, uh, spires. I mean, maybe I, the hunchback I, I, of Notre Dame was I hanging kind of around the top. I kind of have facetiously said, if, if he would have used the word, you could, you could say instead of calling it vanity height, it's aspirational height. Because I think we do aspire. Maybe we aspire to be the tallest, and maybe for various reasons. But we do aspire to something more than just pedestrian, that's functional, cut it off, 
you know, oh, don't, you know, we aspire, uh, humanity is always aspiring to something, and, and for goodness sakes, these terminations, eh, okay, argue it, there's, you know, argue about the sustainability aspect, but these are, I think, um, wonderful expressions of human, um, human desire, and you, you know, the, the joy of a beautiful object. I mean, I, I really, it, it would be nice, I mean, the, it, it is just, it is a list of data, and I've been working for the last, you know, few, few months with the skyscraper center board, um, collecting data, and, and it's just really difficult to get good data from people about their buildings. And so I think it's a, don't, don't underestimate how challenging it is to get something that's reasonably accurate and therefore compare it. So I think that, you know, people have to realize what it is, it's data, and, and you know, for the sake of, I mean, if you're looking at sustainability, how many of these buildings are there in the world compared to how much gross square footage exists in the world? So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very small piece of something. So I think everything has to be put in, in perspective that most people are not in this crapshoot, in the gambling game. We, you know, stakes are pretty high and not too many people are playing, so. Okay, thank you. James. You know, when I, when, I, when I first started studying this topic, I knew that there were some gray areas, and that's why I wanted to actually put out that question about buildings changing over time. And I think after today's discussion, I think there are even grayer areas. But I do think, as Peter would say, I think it's really important to be consistent because people are planning these tall buildings for a decade, and they're planning towards a certain criteria. So from that perspective, I do think it's important to be consistent. Thank I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> um, but but I, no, I, I think you know, it's obvious there's, there's as many opinions about, about this and various aspects of this as that there are people in here uh, in this room. And that's what's really fascinating. At the same time, um, we are, you know, as, as professionals, you know, we're working, we're kind of working to rule. And so, so from, from the standpoint of just this, keeping the list, I think it is important that we maintain a consistency with the list. But, but you know, we shouldn't be constrained. If, you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if an owner wants to, wants to um, uh, uh, call his building the tallest building in Tulsa, that's fine. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with that because I think that's part of human nature. Human, humans mm -hmm. want to kind of measure themselves against each other. And that's kind of what we facilitate here. Mm -hmm.